Hey everybody, this is Craig Cottle, Director of Nature Blind School. There's all kinds of really cool things that you can see in the outdoors. We're going to be looking at tracks, we're going to be looking at trees, we're going to be looking at how to use a map and compass, and we're going to be looking at a bunch of plants. So follow along with me and Tracker and let's see what we can figure out. Hey, this time of year it's difficult to find a lot of food and medicine and plants. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you back last year when I found a bunch of stuff and I'm going to show you some of those things. Here's what I have to tell you right now. This is very important. You should never eat plants unless you have the approval of an adult. They need to know what you're doing. This is something that you should never do on your own. Look at the plants. I like to, really like to, look at plants and draw them and sketch them. Have fun doing what I can trying to make my drawing look exactly like what it looks like on the earth and that way it helps me remember what some of these things look like. So be cautious, don't pull any plants up and kill them unless an adult says that you can. Well, we've got one of my little favorite easily identified plants right here, which is the common blue violet. Actually, we have lots of them right here, all through here. So we'll take a look at the identifying features, how to use it, the violets grow wild in eastern and actually much of central North America, although people plant them in gardens anywhere. So you're likely to find it in a lot of places. The leaves on the violet are odorless and heart-shaped. They're hairless, they're shallow tooth, meaning they don't have any big lobes on them or anything of that nature. They go to three to five inches long, depending upon how much water and nutrition is in the soil. And you can add these violets, these common blue violets, to muffins, to salads. You can put them in ice cream, you can put them in dishes, anything that you want to pretty up a dish and make it look a little bit better. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of nutritional benefit, doesn't have any bad taste. It's a very mild flavor flower, but uh, it's fun to get and put into stuff that you want to, hey, take a look at that and hey, look at me, guys, take it to parties. I'm a naturalist. I have flowers in my food kind of stuff. So just have fun with it. Let's take a look. At the beginning when they come out in early spring, the leaves are really tightly curled up. It's very unique. And each leaf grows on top of a single slender hairless leaf stalk about three to eight inches high. Now think about recipes that call for cooked greens. You got that? Substitute the leafy structure of violets into that recipe and you've got a nice addition. Now keep in mind, you wanna eat the young leaves, uh, particularly here in the spring, and, and if it grows back in the fall, in different areas, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the young leaves, you don't wanna eat the really uh, adult leaves, and you do not want to eat the root system. It's a rhizome, meaning it's interconnected root system between all these violets that are right here. That can induce nausea and vomiting, so we wanna stay, stay away from the root system of these violets. That was the common blue violet. Thanks for joining me. Well, supposedly that right there looks like the tooth of a lion, or at least that's how the naming came about. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, this is a dandelion leaf. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at all the identifying characteristics of it, and then we're gonna talk about how we can utilize it. Dandelions are probably one of the best known wild edibles. However, there's just so many people that hate them in their yards, so it gets easily recognized. They get most easily recognized by the flowers, but it is the actual leaves, young leaves before the flowers pop out that are probably gonna be the most scrumptious and useful to you. The jagged leaves grow from three to 12 inches in length. There's quite a wide variety there and even half to sometimes up to two and a half to three inches wide. It's quite remarkable how much variance there is. What they do do though, is they always grow in a basal rosette, which means all the leaf structure grows from a central point, basically at the stem. Now, going back to our tooth of the lion, dandelion, the leaves large teeth always point toward the leaf base, which is mostly unique in the natural world, not outward and toward the tip of the leaf. As far as the flower is concerned, you have a basically a short stubby green uh, f rounded, uh, again, this flattened flower buds that form in the middle of that basal rosette that I mentioned earlier before the slender flower stalks lift. Each bud individually has two to 18 inches above the ground. Again, a wide variance depending upon the nutrition that's found in the soil and the soil itself. Now the familiar flower head can again be up to 
two inches in width. I mean, it's quite remarkable, the variance in size. These little green portions that are below are called green bracts, and they always extend downward from the flower. And the flower is what's referred to as a ray flower. Uh, very similar to the basal ro rosette leaves in that basically these flower petals all extend from a central point and come out from the stem. First off, eating dandelion leaves is going to be tastier in the early spring. The longer it goes, the more bitter they get. And again, bitter is good for your digestive tract. I'm not saying you should not eat dandelions, just be aware that the older they get, the more bitter they get. But let's consider the nutritional powerhouse this little guy is so that you know what you're getting when you eat those leaves. The leaves are jam-packed with beta carotene. Actually, there's, there's uh, more beta carotene in dandelion leaves per weight than a carrot, and that is for certain. They have more iron and calcium than spinach, so this is just a fantastically nutritious leaf. Uh, actually, you will often get some spring mixes from the grocery store that have dandelions or chicory, which is a close cousin to dandelions, in your spring mix. So don't forego this just because it's a yard weed. It's actually something you're probably paying money for in a grocery store. They also have a host of vitamins like B1, B2, B5, B6, B12, C, E, P, and D, plus biotin, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, and zinc. Last but not least, you know, we always like to talk about responsible foraging. So I always look for opportunities for stewardship minded foraging, which means you are an active participant in wild plants growing properly. So anytime that I get an opportunity to help plant seed, I'm going to. Basically what we have here are the seed pods, which these basically happen overnight. That yellow head will turn into this white head. And we have little parachutes with the seed on the bottom and we'll make sure that all these get dispersed into this wind today and do our part for more dandelions in the future. Well, the reason that people call this dead nettle is because the leaves have that particular look to them as if they are dead, but they're not. They're quite alive, actually. And this particular plant is part of the mint family. Uh, one of the most distinguishing characteristics about the mint family is that it has a four-sided stem, like a square-sized stem. Now this particular plant often is confused with henbit, but there's some very distinguishing characteristics about this that I want to point out. Maybe we'll look at a henbit at another day. Purple dead nettle has triangular shaped leaves and the stalk is attached to the stem's leaf blade. Purple dead nettle has distinctive pink flowers that you see right here. They typically bloom in April, but right now we are mid-March and it's blooming here in Kentucky. They'll last about six weeks and at the end of that six weeks they're going to put out a seed cluster so that it'll spread for next season. Another thing that's very unique about these flowers is they're very tubular in shape. So get down there and take a look at them real closely when they get a chance because they're very unique. Another thing is the upper and lower lip ends of the flowers will basically incline or lean into one another. That's another distinguishing characteristic. Bees really love the pollen, the nectar that comes off of these, so you'll see bees flying around. It's another reason to uh, be stewardship minded. You don't want to harvest a ton of this if you don't actually need it. Uh, a good thought process is take only what you need in a survival situation, for example, and come out at the end of this flowering season and spread the seeds so there's even more for the bees. Now the upper leaves are going to be purple or reddish in color. And that's another one of these distinguishing characteristics. And that's why, guess what? It's called purple dead nettle. These leaves appear very similar to what you see in stinging nettle. They're very crowded around the axis of the stem itself. The dried leaves can be used as a poultice to stop bleeding. Again, check with your medical practitioner or those that have expanded knowledge and think that you could possibly have some sort of allergic reaction. So make sure that you are going through the procedure to check, make sure you're not allergic to this before you ever need it in a survival situation. Another thing I love pointing out about purple dead nettle is that we look at it, uh, well not we, not me personally, but a lot of people in the United States look at it as if it is a weed. Whereas in Europe and Northern Africa, they actually grow this and use it medicinally and as a food resource. Now, as far as uses is concerned, what you want to do is utilize the leaves, not the stems or the flowers, just the leaves. And you can utilize it in salads. Again, anytime you're going to utilize anything wild, I would take the time to wash it whenever you can. If you're a survival situation, totally different. You have to do what you have to do. But in modern times where we're starting to utilize weeds, weeds if you will, 
in our daily life, then you want to make sure you take it home and wash it just like you do any other vegetable. This has been Purple Dead Nettle. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, you'll see it a lot in the spring. A lot of times here in Kentucky, for those that are familiar with the southeast and you have big fields of corn or soybeans, it's one of the things that will come up as a cover crop naturally in those fields. So in the early spring, you'll see these beautiful purple fields. And typically, that's what we're looking at, purple dead nettle. See all those pink things behind me in the trees? A little hard for me to reach. I've got another one over here that I'm going to walk up to and I can show you. You probably think that's red buds, but I call it pink popcorn. You'll see why in just a minute. So you look in the scientific literature, it's Cursus canadensis. I think that's how you say it. Common name, Eastern red bud. But in the Craig Cottle language, pink popcorn. Because you can just pick this off the tree and eat it. Again, I always recommend cleaning stuff when you can. But from a survival perspective, if this is all you've got, all you have access to, you can literally pull this off the tree and eat it. Let me tell you about it. The eastern redbud tree really prefers slightly shaded areas. So you'll often see it just like you see it here on the edge of habitat where you go from a wooded area into an open area. Uh, a lot of people have these in their yards too and they'll do fine. But uh, as far as a forest tree, this is the typical arrangement for it. For example, the, what's uh, worthy of note here is the stem, the trunk of this particular tree is probably, I don't know, eight or nine feet back into the woods. And it has come all the way over here to get sunlight just for these blooms. And you can see this little branch has a lot of blooms on it. They're very bright. They're, they've been out for about three days now. Over here, however, this tree, which is another eastern redbud tree that is in full sunlight, it's got some buds up in the crown of the tree, but not as many. And this tree is going to be the most blooming tree here eventually. So the reason I'm saying that is because it's going to start to just thrive when um, the blooms come out, but it gets some shade as well. In this full sunlight, it's going to be somewhat hurtful to it. Let's talk about some of the identifying features of the tree itself. So this is pretty typical right here, this species, in that it has a short trunk before it starts branching out, pretty common. It has a rounded crown, and one of the identifying features, even in the wintertime, is that it has zigzag patterning on the terminal stems along the branch line. As I mentioned earlier, it almost always leans towards sunlight wherever it's going to be able to find it, particularly in a forest. Now let's talk about some of the identifying features of the bark in particular. Now this is an older tree, so you'll notice that it has furrows that are already starting to form in here. And they're not really scaly. They're really tight, but they do have furrows about the thickness of maybe a fingernail. Whereas, let's walk over here to this young tree. On a young tree, the bark is tight really tight, almost skin-like to the stem itself. Now this looks like a branch, but this is actually the top of the tree that has grown up underneath of that cedar tree and has come way over here to get to its sunlight. But even at the base, the bark looks really tight like this rather than furrows and scaly like we saw on the older tree. Hmm, how many ways can you use the Eastern Red Bud? Dream it up, because you can do it. Add it to salads, add it to pancake fritters, Add it to your hand and put it in your mouth. Some people will put this into eggs. Some people put it into this and that. You just dream it up. It again, when you pick it and eat it, a, a, a lot of the references say that it has a, a sour sweet taste. I have never found that to be true. I always find this to be very sweet and not sour at all. So I actually just love them as is. So think about it. Any way that you want to add this to any dish that you might want to have a little tasty treat, think about sugar snap peas or some of that nature. That's kind of the flavor you get from these. You can add them to whatever you want to and you've got a nice tasty treat. Well, hope you really enjoyed that walk through the fields and the woods to find stuff that we could utilize for food and medicine. And again, just one more caution. You should never pick plants or kill any branches or cut trees or anything without the approval of an adult. Thank you as always. Hope you've enjoyed it. Come on, join in. Let's learn together.